hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. And yet we know of only one that shines on a life-filled planet. Is Earth unique? Or are there other solar systems and planets like ours? Out there. Now, scientists are finding the answer. Thanks to this, the Kepler Space Telescope, the most powerful planet hunter ever built. It's making astonishing discoveries. The sheer numbers of planets out there is really quite stupendous. From enormous gas giants to a land where the sun never sets to worlds that may be entirely covered in water. Kepler is even finding planets like our own. This might be the first Earth analog around a sun-like star that's ever been found. Scientists are beginning to wonder if those planets could be inhabited. And if so, by what? It's fun to speculate about life. But any life is going to be subject to the laws of chemistry and physics. Even on another planet, we can work out how biology is likely to adapt. This is the story of how one spectacular spacecraft has brought us closer than ever to answering mankind's ultimate question. Are we alone? Alien planets revealed right now on Nova. Major funding for Nova is provided by the following. The David H. Koch Fund for Science. Supporting NOVA and promoting public understanding of science. And by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Additional funding is provided by Millicent Bell through the Millicent and Eugene Bell Foundation. The most ambitious planet hunter ever built sits on a launch pad at Cape Canaveral, Florida. T minus five, four, three, two, it's engine start, one, zero. Over two decades in the making, it is about to radically alter what we know about our galaxy. Zero three. Burning out of the solids, for separation. Meet the Kepler Space Telescope. Its mission, to detect alien worlds orbiting distant stars, and to discover if any of them could be a suitable home for life as we know it. Project scientist Natalie Batala has lived with the Kepler mission from the very first moment. To watch it launch was really quite something. This feeling that after decades of planning, it was finally happening, it was, it was going up there. That was a tremendous moment. Launched in 2009, this incredible optical telescope has revealed that planets are far more common than we ever imagined. What's amazing is not just the number of planets that Kepler has found, but the types of planets. Of the 3,500 potential planets that Kepler has spotted, some seem familiar. Huge gas giants, similar to Jupiter or Saturn. Or smaller rocky worlds that could be like Earth, Venus, Mars, or Mercury. 
but others are straight out of science fiction. Like Kepler-16b, which orbits a double star, just like Luke Skywalker's home planet in Star Wars. Even more bizarre is Kepler-10b. It orbits so closely to its sun that the surface is a vision of hell. Kepler-10b is a scorched world that's got an ocean bigger than the Pacific Ocean, that it's an ocean not of water, but of, of molten lava. That star-facing side, as it orbits, has surface temperatures in excess of that required to melt iron. So this is a blow-torched world. But for Kepler, these oddities are just a sideshow. Because its primary mission is to find a planet that might have the right conditions for alien life. A planet like Earth. Now, Kepler might be closing in on just such a world. The Kepler data suggests that potentially habitable planets are out there. And applying the principles of biology and evolution, scientists are even beginning to guess how ETs could have adapted to their environments. The best speculation recognizes that there are rules to the game. Any life that we can contemplate is going to be subject to the laws of chemistry and physics. Kepler is finding worlds that, as far as we can tell, have the right environment, the correct temperatures suitable for life as we know it. Kepler is unique among space telescopes. Unlike the Hubble, which turned its gaze far and wide and sent back stunning images of the cosmos. Kepler is designed to stare fixedly at one small patch of sky, taking the same snapshot day in and day out for years on end. It began, as with any new telescope, with what astronomers call first light. Kepler's first light image came down to us at NASA Ames about 24 hours after we ejected the dust cover. As it filled my computer screen, the image that came to my mind was like champagne filling a glass with all of these stars being the little bubbles. It was very exciting. Every single tiny dot that you see is a star that is in the field of view of Kepler. Kepler is focused on a small patch of sky near the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. In that area of sky are four and a half million stars in our galaxy alone. But Kepler isn't looking for stars. It's looking for planets that orbit the stars. But that's a problem because Kepler can't directly see planets. Planets are much smaller and dimmer than stars. They get lost in the glare. So Kepler is looking for something called a transit, which occurs when a planet passes in front of the star. As it does so, it dims the light by a fraction. That dimming is what Kepler is designed to detect. It's a principle that can be illustrated with a distant tower and a spotlight. Okay, let's imagine that there's a moth flying around that spotlight. Could we ever hope to see the moth? No way. The moth, although it does reflect a tiny bit of the spotlight's light, it's far too feeble for us to see that. Since the light reflected off a planet is typically 10 billion times fainter than the light emitted by its star, detecting a planet might seem impossible. But Kepler has a way around that problem. If the moth passes in front of the bright light, a little bit of the light that was going to reach us obviously gets blocked by the moth. Then we are able to detect the moth 
by measuring very carefully that very subtle change in the total brightness of the spotlight. The bigger the moth, the more light it blocks, and the more the light dims. In exactly the same fashion, that's how we can detect small planets orbiting other stars and even measure their sizes. That's Kepler's primary mission, to watch thousands of stars for signs of a transit. Scientists plot the brightness of each star in Kepler's view on a graph to see how it changes over time. This is an actual plot of one star over two weeks. Sure enough, every three days there's a tiny dip in brightness, revealing a planet orbiting this star once every three days. Just like the moth, the bigger the planet, the more light it blocks. In this plot, a huge planet transits in front of its star, causing a much larger dip. Right from the start, Kepler saw stars dimming. By June 2010, 15 months after launch, Kepler had found over 700 potential planets. The sheer numbers of planets out there is really quite stupendous. Here you see just a small sample of them. And the planets range in size from, you know, a half the radius of the Earth up to things that are several times larger than Jupiter. Already, Kepler's discoveries are changing what we know about alien planets. Kepler has revolutionized our view of planets and planetary systems in our galaxy. It turns out that any kind of planet is possible within the laws of physics and chemistry. Any planet you can conceive of can exist in any location in a planetary system. Extrapolating from the Kepler data, some estimates put the number of planets in the universe in the trillions. But what everyone really wants to know is do any of these planets have life? To answer that, we have to go back to the basics and ask, is the universe full of the same stuff everywhere? Are the elements needed for life as we know it commonplace? The lightest elements, hydrogen and helium, were made in the moments after the Big Bang. Other elements are made in stars, a product of nuclear fusion during the star's normal life cycle, or produced when some stars explode as supernovas, scattering these essential building blocks into space. Every molecule in your body, every element in your body was generated sometime in the distant past by processes within stars. Among the most common are the elements that are essential to all living things on Earth. Hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. Life could be anywhere or everywhere in our galaxy. But where should we look? Since planets are proving to be so abundant, Chris McKay thinks we might as well search for life that follows rules we already understand. I know how to search for organic material. I know what the signatures that would be important are. So the search for life starts off following water, following carbon. Not because we can prove that that's the only way to do it, but because that's the only way we know how to do it. Sifting through the Kepler data, scientists have made a deliberate decision to look for planets that resemble the one place they know can sustain life the Earth. We know that the Earth is habitable, indeed inhabited, and so surely there's some drive to find another Earth-like planet elsewhere in the universe. 